All right, what's up everyone? This time I am recording at night, so I'm gonna go to bed right after this. Uh, just did my collaboration video with uh, another pretty prominent YouTuber whose channel is about a thousand times the size of mine, so maybe we'll actually have a little bit of a community here soon and I won't have to do a day in the life video, which would be lit. Um, in the meantime, I am going to be making a video that I have been putting off for literally months now just because I wanted to do other stuff and some guy asked me to probably make a video about this maybe on episode 5 and I've kind of just been a dick in putting it off so I'm glad I could finally get to it. I'm going to have to find that original comment and tell him I did this but um, okay, let's talk about uh, serialization. Alrighty, so what do I mean by data serialization? Well, basically, for starters, on computers, most data is actually stored in memory, and we're going to be doing that through the use of objects or classes or something like that. But a lot of the time, we have to go ahead and transport this data somehow, and generally speaking, we have to do this as a byte stream. That could be either writing this data to a disk, for example, or sending it over the network to another computer in a distributed system. Either way, the point is we have to actually be able to convert data from this in-memory representation, which might contain things like hashes or pointers, and go ahead and put that into a format readable by other computers. There are a lot of ways to go about doing this, there are a lot of ways that we can represent this data, and each obviously has their pros and cons, and we're going to discuss a bunch of those in this episode. So as you can see, for example, if I wanted to convert uh, the class below, which is a person and you know has some key features that are extremely important, um, to a sequence of bytes. Um, I would have to go ahead and convert that pointer over somehow and be able to kind of serialize that maybe as JSON or something else, but we'll discuss all these options in a second. Okay, so what's the naive approach to serialization? Well, as it would turn out, most programming languages actually have libraries built in in order to serialize objects. Um, there's Pickle, Marshall, Serializable, but all of these are pretty bad in the sense that it pretty much limits you to one language, which is not huge. They're not very focused on performance, which is another issue with them. And additionally, they offer kind of some security vulnerability in the sense that um, if you know someone with malicious intent can get you to kind of depickle or demarshal um, some arbitrary um, byte stream that they wrote, it might allow them to instantiate arbitrary classes and do things that you don't want them doing. So as a result, generally speaking, these language-specific serialization frameworks, while easy to use, are probably not the move. Okay, what about standardizing codings like JSON or XML? Well, basically, as you can see, there's a lot of red that I wrote here, but the truth of the matter is um, these are extremely pop popular, and the reason for that is that they're extremely popular. Um, you know, it's kind of a network effect, which is that if you can get um, two different companies to go ahead and agree on some sort of common format for data exchange, there's a ton of value in that, and so the fact that JSON and XML are so widely used in the past just encourages the um, you know further use of them, and especially for cross-organizational um, data transfer, uh, JSON and XML are both extremely popular. However, they definitely have their issues. For starters, with XML in particular, you can't really differentiate between numbers and strings. For JSON, you can't really um, differentiate between integers and floats, and with floats in particular, you can't really specify the precision of floats. Um, additionally, you can only deal with Unicode strings as opposed to binary ones consisting of just zeros and ones. And then finally, they're not particularly compact, which means there's more network overhead to have to actually go ahead and send some XML from one computer to another. Same goes for JSON. Main reason for this being that we have all these you know, strings representing keys or fields that we have to send over, and that's kind of annoying. Um, you can improve the size of your encoding a little bit by binary encoding. However, even still, even with this slight optimization, you still have to go ahead and include all of those field names, and so you're not actually doing that much better. So instead, what do a lot of companies want to go ahead and use when they're doing this kind of internal data transfer only? As in, yeah, you're transferring data from computer to computer, but it's within your company, so you can kind of deal with um, you know, getting computers to agree on the format that you're going to use. Well, this is where something like thrift or protocol buffers comes in. Thrift and protocol buffers are two libraries created by Facebook and Google respectively. I think Thrift has since been open source to the Apache license, but basically all they do is they create these very compact binary encodings that they're able to do so because before actually going and creating the binary encodings, what you do in Thrift and protocol buffers is actually specify a schema of the type of message that you're going to go ahead and encode. 
So once the schema is provided, you can actually use code generation tools in your IDE to represent classes for all of these types of messages. And basically the way that they work is that with these two in particular, each of these fields within a message actually has a number. And that number is going to allow you to very um, compactly kind of express which field it is that you're sending in a JSON message as opposed to having to write out the entire name of a string. Another thing that these are really useful for is for documenting schema evolution. So basically, if you're going to have some sort of set schema for your data, it is probably the case that at one point or another throughout the life cycle of your application development, you're going to actually have to change that data. Additionally, even things like rolling upgrades in your servers mean that it's very likely that servers are going to be running different versions of software at the same time. And as a result, we want to be able to achieve both backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility. Where backwards compatibility basically just means that newer code can read the messages encoded by older code. Forwards compatibility is basically just saying that older versions of the code or older versions of the software on the server can read messages written by the newer code. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be handled in the same way, but it does mean that you at least don't want things crashing. So how does schema evolution work in both protocol buffers and thrift? Well, for starters, everything is kind of based around those field tags, right? Field tags are what we use in order to identify kind of which data corresponds to which field. So as it turns out, you actually can't change existing field tags, but you definitely can add new ones. And so in addition to being able to kind of add these new fields with unique tag numbers, we know that this both ensures forward compatibility because the old code can basically just ignore any new fields included in messages. And it also ensures backwards compatibility because the new code, since it has still those existing field tags from before, it can actually go ahead and read all these fields contained in the old versions of the messages. Um, that being said, obviously any um, kind of new field tags that we're adding have to be optional because otherwise those old messages aren't going to contain them and it would crash newer versions of the code. And then additionally, depending on the certain um, you know, situation that you're dealing with, you can sometimes actually change the data type of the code. You can refer to the documentation for these services um, for which data types you can change to what. But that being said, um, protocol buffers and thrift are certainly not perfect. Um, by virtue of having to evolve your schema by adding only new tags and not actually kind of being able to add and remove fields as you go, we lose a lot of flexibility because that doesn't really reflect how actual database schemas evolve, right? Like it's the fact that a lot of the times columns will just be removed. And so if you want to go ahead and automate kind of this schema generation for a given existing format of data, it's hard to do that because the schema generation versus the actual data formatting is not going to be one to one if you just have to basically add a field even though you know in reality some columns may have been removed from that database. So I'll explain that more in a little bit, but basically the solution to this is Apache Abro. So similar to protocol buffers and thrift in the sense that you know we're using this to kind of encode these different types of messages using a schema. However, it's better suited for cases where you have big data and data where the scheme can definitely change over time. Um, so again, we're declaring the schema, but this time there are no field tags. So instead, we're using the schema to decode the data, but it's got to be in the same order as the fields. And additionally, we can still have schema evolutions. So how do we actually have schema evolutions? Well, basically, there's this concept of the writer and the reader schema. So basically every message that's encoded is encoded with a writer schema and then eventually that message is going to reach some end node where it is going to be decoded and the end node contains some sort of reader schema. Now it is the case that the writer schema and the reader schema can actually be different. And Abro kind of has some cool logic to actually go ahead and kind of rectify the differences between them. And it's mainly through the use of the actual field names themselves. So as you can see in the image below, basically, even though the, the ordering of the field names is not exactly the same, if you contain both the writer schema and the reader schema, you know, when trying to make uh, a read or, you know, deserializing a message, you can go ahead and say, okay, well, now I see where the username field should be. Now I see how kind of interest maps to interest and favorite number maps to favorite number. And so even though the order is uh, changed, you can go ahead and rectify that and kind of figure out which fields of the message plug into which fields. Um, so basically what we now do is if these, um, 
schemas are different. If there are fields present in the writer schema and not in the reader schema, it means that we no longer care about those, they can just be ignored. If there are fields present in the reader schema and not in the writer schema, then we have to go ahead and use the default value provided for those fields. This is something that you can obviously do in Avro, and it's probably something that you should be doing in order to go ahead and make sure that your schema can evolve over time. Hence, obviously, fields can only be added or removed if they have a default value, because otherwise you're going to be in trouble, and it's not going to know what to kind of make of a given field if it's not included in the document. Okay, so how do we actually optimize network bandwidth? Because I just kind of mentioned that, you know, now with Avro, in order to kind of decode a message, you need both the writer schema and the reader schema, which is problematic if we're sending all of these messages over the network. We don't want to have to also include the writer schema. That can take up a ton of space. It'll slow everything down. It's not really acceptable. But do keep in mind that a lot of the time, what you're doing with Avro is dealing with Hadoop files. And what that means is that you probably have one big file and all of these records encoded in the same way. So generally speaking, you can actually just go ahead and send that writer schema over one time and then use that for all of those different records. That being said, if you have a bunch of records that are written in all these different ways, what you can actually do is after encoding them, you can include a version number with each record that corresponds to the writer schema, and then that way the decoding, uh, you know, the decoding node can go ahead and pull the correct writer schema using the version number every single time it's decoding a message. And that way you only have to you know, send over all of the versions of the writer schema once. Okay, so why are field tags bad? Because I kind of touched upon this before, and this is kind of where Avro um, optimizes over both thrift and protocol buffers. Basically, the point is, a lot of the time you want to be able to automate the task of having all of these different things in a database, and keep in mind that database schema can be evolving over time, and then we want to be able to automatically create that serializ serialization schema from the updated database configuration. We want it to all be a very seamless process because if we're ever going to do like an ETL job, which basically means pull everything from the database and plop it into something like a distributed file system, it's very important to kind of be able to automatically generate the serialization. If we had to do it manually by hand every time, that would be really annoying. So basically, Avro allows us to more easily automate this process because like I said before, it doesn't rely on having to kind of just append new fields with a unique field tag, but instead you basically just list out whatever you have in there, and then the Avro logic will kind of figure out the differences between the reader and writer schema. Obviously, if you do think about it and you kind of are logical, you probably can automate the thrift or protocol buffers process as well. However, it just seems a little bit easier to do it with Avro. Okay, and then let's also just quickly touch upon how schema evolution is really useful in databases. We have this concept of data outliving code, which means that in a database we have records that are potentially written from multiple different versions of a writer schema. And we have servers that are reading um, rows from the database using potentially many different um, you know, serialization schemas on read. So we have all these different schema mismatches, and as a result of that, being able to use this framework for um, evolving data makes sure that you have this forwards and backwards compatibility in order to make sure that processes don't crash from data that was eventually written to the database in different formats. You also just make, have to make sure to keep in mind that anytime you're performing a read modify update cycle with um, an older version of the reader schema on the basically the node that's going to perform the update, that you basically go ahead and you know don't just like ignore all of the data that isn't in your reader schema because eventually when you make that update you want to make sure that data is still included even if it wasn't important to you you know in the actual code itself so that's one thing to keep in note okay so in conclusion basically these text serialization libraries are super commonplace especially just within services that only stay within one organization, right? Once you're going to cross organizational services, you probably want to be using something like JSON because of the super high support. But within one organization, protocol buffers, Thrift, Avro can all save you a ton of network IO, almost maybe even half as much, especially if you're transporting terabytes of data over the network. And so these have shown to be super useful, not only for actually saving time via this kind of binary compression, but in addition to that, 
the schemas act as effectively a documentation of all the different types of messages and the data evolution that you have over all of your services. And that allows you to decode older messages or even just you know take a look and say like, oh, this is how we originally had things, this is how we changed it. And it's a really good form of documentation in that sense. So overall, I know this is kind of like a topic that may not come up as much during systems design interviews. However, you know, in practical considerations, being able to actually encode data um, or serialize it into a byte stream more efficiently is hugely important for saving time, especially when working with big data in either batch or stream processing. All right, guys, have a good one, and I'm going to pass out.